This week, COP29 comes up with $300 billion per year to help developing countries in the global south lower their emissions and adapt to climate change, which, let's face it, isn't even their fault. It's not even enough money to buy water wings for everyone living on the coast down there. A massive heat wave is hitting parts of Australia. The problem is being made worse by coal-fired electricity plants being down for maintenance. On the plus side, more coal will be available for the Christmas stockings of Australian politicians looking to expand the country's natural gas output. A next-generation nuclear reactor is giving the go-ahead in the United States. It uses fluoride salt to keep it cooling instead of water, because it works better. Just don't tell RFK Jr., Brian. And I don't get that joke, and I'm very pleased that I don't. He's against fluoride Voters. and water. He's uh, against fluoride and water, you see? Something like so that. So I guess he'd be against fluoride and... New Why should I have to explain my jokes to you? Voters in Ann Arbor, Michigan have approved a local clean energy utility. Ann Arbor voters were no doubt swayed by my visit to their city just days before the election. Or maybe they just realized it was a fantastic idea. All that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also on the show this week, California plans to offset anything bad that Trump does to EVs to say, screw you, sir. And the train from San Francisco to Han San Jose is now electrified and a whole lot more on the show that we won't mention. But yeah, how are you doing? It's really a horrible, horrible weather situation where we live in the prairies of Canada. Winter has reared its ugly head and it is disgustingly cold and snowy. Yes. It's horrible. Hawaii, yeah. I'm going to move there one day, I promise you. I, I just have to find a way. We got no snow, no snow, no snow, and then we got all the snow all at once. All of it. All of it. My electrified, my plug-in electric snowblower saved my life, although my heart still almost stopped a couple of times because, you know, <laughs> but yeah. So I really enjoyed your story last week about your harrowing car trip in an EV to Saskatoon. I, I always enjoy stories like that. I don't know it, why. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't an EV story, really. It was a tire yeah, story, yeah. which reminds tire. me, I'm going to interject here because I, I, was, I wanted to talk about this. I saw a story on CBC, our national public broadcaster in Canada, about a Tesla accident in Toronto or somewhere, somewhere in eastern Canada. I think it was Toronto. It was Toronto. And the people crashed at high speed and everyone burned alive. Okay. Unpleasant story. <laughs> yeah. And the, they talked about how you couldn't, you know, if the electricity is cut off, you can't open doors on Teslas, right? Um, no, there's an emergency There's latch. an emergency latch. Yeah. And they showed it and it's hidden away and maybe the people didn't know it. It's a horrible story. And they talked about how the first responders were traumatized and then, and, and, you know, but they said EVs are EVs a risk because when the power's cut off, the doors won't open. Well, that's just freaking Tesla. Well, it could be other people, but it has nothing to do with the fact that they're an EV. They could have made combustion vehicles and chosen to do it that way. Yeah. My point is, Brian, that if you have a Tesla, perhaps you should have a safety orientation when you're taking someone for a ride for the first time. You didn't do this for me, by the way. No. And we were using automated driving. Who knows what could have happened? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have to show them where to release the door handle if the power is, I think it needs to be like an airline and an yeah. oxygen mask drop and so on. And Safety demonstration. So yes, there's normally you just press a button and then a solenoid unlocks the door, but there's another kind of hidden manual latch and that's the override. And yeah, it's kind of hidden. It's not super obvious, but I have one friend who I drive around occasionally and she always pulls the emergency one instead of the regular button. I'm and every do single that. time, I'm gonna do I tell her, no, 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 that's Musk. not the door one. You're supposed to use the button. And it, it doesn't, even though it's a sort of a hidden thing, that's the one that she naturally goes to. Okay. Well, just be aware of that if you own a Tesla. And I know a few of you do, obviously, who listen to a show like this, too. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know. They People couldn't open the vehicle, you know, people getting there, they had to smash the windows and things and i don't know if it had any effect on that accident but it's just one of those things but it just made me yell at the tv my family had to watch me yell at the tv and pause it i couldn't take anymore evs are dangerous evs you know come on it has nothing to do with it and you know a gas vehicle with the same technology could have burst into flames just as easily yeah 
and not and if the doors weren't able to open and no one knew how to open them, then yeah. Or if they were unconscious and the people outside couldn't open the doors because they were not yeah. mechanical, they're electric. Yeah, that's the case. And that, you know, that's probably going to be the case in robo taxis. We talk a lot about robo taxis lately. Well, they're more than likely going to have electric doors that will shut themselves and latch. So, yeah. but, you know, maybe they'll play an actual orientation video because Waymo does. Waymo plays a video when you get in the yeah, vehicle. That totally makes sense. But, yeah. Sorry. I, I real that was a huge interjection, and <laughs> but I had to get it off my chest. Okay, back to my interjection. So I just wanted to talk about your story last week because people are probably listening to that and thinking, well, you know, why didn't you just take a bus or something? And we've said before, we just have very poor public transit options around here, which is what leads us to want to own cars and want to own EVs and stuff. I did look it up. We do have a commercial bus service between Regina and Saskatoon, and you did have one option to take a bus that morning, but it would have gotten you there too late. It would have gotten you to downtown Saskatoon at 10.55 a.m. You needed to be at your place at 11. So you would have had to go the day before and yeah. spend an extra night in a hotel if you were going to take the bus. Ironically, but my, technically my GPS possible. said I was going to arrive at 10.55, but that was right, <laughs> yeah, at, that's the, right. That's yeah. right at the location. So, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it would have cost more than a car because the car is like $7 or $8 to get there in an EV and price is everything to me right now. So that's what I have to do. It, had I had a hotel with free charging, it would have cost me that for a round trip, which would have been pretty cool too. And we've got a letter that addresses that. I'll talk a bit more about my adventure later in the letter section of the show. Yeah. And once you spend the money on a car, you tend to, you know, want to use it. And we know that we really kind of need cars around here for all the other uses. I, I'll remind you that also that car, the Chevy Bolt EV is my partner's car for her work she's a social worker and her work pays her more than the car you know costs to operate yeah. and finance uh just yeah, to have right. a car to drive around as a social worker because she helps clients out yeah usually when you use your own car for work they pay you a mileage based like a per kilometer thing and it's typically based on the cost for a gas car and we know that EVs are and wear and tear and oil changes and yeah. all that too so and depreciation so that's uh yeah, it works out well for us to have that car. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't, I would imagine. So, yeah, we're lucky. Yes. And the one thing I meant to add at the end of your uh, horrible fire story is, of course, we always like to point out, statistically speaking, a gas car is way more likely to. Uh, and somebody did eventually mention that, that it was 20 times more likely. But, you know, people, they see a story like this and then I'll never get an EV. It's delaying things by. Yeah. And, and the, the reporters, they don't know how to deal with it. They just don't know how to deal with it. And then they got into e fires from e-bikes, you know, and they didn't talk about how, why those fires happen, that they're uncertified batteries that are overcharged and there is a solution to it. And New York, we, you had a great story a few weeks ago of them cracking down on it because they had fatal, fatal fires from EV batter or from uh, electric bike batteries that were from China and weren't certified under the electrical standards so now that they're cracking down on them the fires are way down and that should be that way you know my partner asked me what about the battery on the electric snow shovel you have and, and is that different than the e-bike battery well it is because it's got an expensive charger that comes with it it's not just a, an outlet that goes in and charge 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 and unplug when it after x number of hours you it will determine if there's overheating in the battery and shut down like we have an electric vacuum cleaner portable stick vacuum cleaner and if you use it until it dies the battery's warm and it will not charge right away so the lights will flash and it will sit there for an hour maybe even two hours before it starts charging because it has that stuff built in and yeah we've yeah. got our phones do the same thing otherwise we'd all be on fire right now <laughs> <laughs> and my laptop in front of me and everything else so it's all good and it's getting safer and speaking of e-bikes, I wanted to talk, I just had a quick trip to Toronto the last few days. And one of the main things I noticed, you know, I was staying in downtown Toronto, a real explosion in the number of electric bikes on the roads in uh, downtown so Toronto. So there's no snow there. Like our American no. listeners might think that there's snow, but there's not. There yeah. is here. Yeah, they've had a very mild fall, to say the least. I mean, I think it was, 
you know, 20 Celsius just a, a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago. But, but yeah, tons of e-bikes and they've got more bike lanes downtown and you just see them going all the time. A lot of them are cargo bikes, like people doing deliveries and stuff. And a lot of them are that kind of larger, fat tire, heavier ones that are like more like a moped sized. Which you and wouldn't some... buy unless you wanted to do a lot of beach riding, right? But yeah. <laughs> because it's power, because it's inefficient, right? The bigger yeah. the tire, the less efficient it is. That's why road bikes are, you know, razor thin. Their tires are really thin and they're on hard pavement. And then you get onto mountain biking and they get fatter. But these are really fat. They are made for beaches and snow. And so you're getting them for the worst case scenario, I guess, because it's powered by someone else other than you, although you can power it a little bit. That's interesting. That they're, yeah. But they are taking the bike lanes away. That's a big controversy that the the provincial government is intervening in yeah. civic, saying that it, it'll improve congestion. And we know from statistics and from science that you can put a lot more people on a bike path than you can on a city street per you know, so it actually improves congestion to have bike lanes, but that doesn't tell that to an idiot yeah. premier who's running yeah. the province. Yeah, bike lanes are always a political football, which is unfortunate, but, you know, just my observation, it's like, I think in the downtown area, that's got to be the fastest way to get around is an e-bike. I, I used to do path. that myself. It was faster than a subway yeah. sometimes on a nice yeah, day, yeah. but I did a year round because there wasn't a whole lot of snow in Toronto, at least the year I was there. So, yeah, it's a chilly endeavor and kind of a cold yeah. wet, which you're not used to. We're used to a dry wet or dry yeah. wet, a dry cold here, which it is now. And yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do it in the winter, but yeah, probably in many, many cases, faster than the subway, faster than the streetcars, faster than driving. So we did take a couple of Ubers and I wanted to mention that as well, because one of them was a VinFast. Really? A, a VinFast, VinFast Uber. Wow. Yeah. This is the Did you Vietnamese. talk to the person about it? No, I didn't. But it's your responsibility yeah, it was... as a climate journalist, Brian, to intervene and 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 ask okay. questions. I thought about it, but he seemed like a bit of a nervous driver. He was a bit oh, of a best a hurry, left alone. driver. <laughs> yeah, like or maybe he'd been driving too many hours or something. Yeah. But he he seemed like a bit of a nervous driver, so I I didn't want to bug him. Maybe but, operating on um, caffeine alone at that point. Yeah. So VinFast, this is the Vietnamese car company. This is the first Vietnamese car company that's been, you know, expanding around the world. So they do sell in Canada. I don't think they have sold that many so far, but obviously I rode in one. It was an SUV, kind of like Tesla Model Y sized, and it had a giant screen in the front, very much like a Tesla. So yeah, it seemed nice. It wasn't like super premium feeling or anything, but yeah, it was fine. Well, that's interesting. You know, sometimes Uber, people who decide that that's how they're going to make their living and that's they're committed to it, they will buy the most efficient vehicle they can, which is an EV, not a hybrid. And sometimes Uber has programs to help them. So maybe there was something that we haven't known about because we've talked about it before, some programs that they have for, yeah. for Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. Yeah. And so then the last electric news story from Toronto, our hotel was looking over University Avenue and it happened to be the day of the Santa Claus parade. And first of all, how in 2024 is there a Santa Claus parade? It's, you know, yeah. I remember going to parades when I was a young child, but that's because we had only two TV channels and the internet didn't exist. A parade it... was basically our internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our, our was video a, games. It was a, a huge event, like thousands of people lining the street. Like it went on for two hours, two and a half hours, marching bands, all these float. Like it was crazy. I have no idea why this is still such a big thing because I can't imagine anything more boring to watch. Well, to I had a great time at the first parade I went to in, I don't know, maybe since I was a kid. And that is, well, I went to the Pride Parade in Toronto, which was a blast. Yeah. That yeah, was, that's fun. That's different. That was in the late 90s, and there was a million people there, and it was hot and humid and crazy. And I went to the Pride Parade in Regina, and where we live, and it was a blast. I thought it was just a, such a fun and, and great atmosphere as well. But the Santa Claus Parade is just a bunch of, you know, malls and, and vendors, and maybe you get a glimpse at Santa, and he's a big disappointment at the end. <laughs> but, you know, I saw a thing on... Social media that the Santa Claus parade in 
Quebec or Montreal, one of the two cities in the province of Quebec, Canada, had, you know, a bunch of electric vehicles towing the floats. Like the Cybertruck was, there was a several Cybertrucks pulling floats and Ford F-150 Lightning. So they said, yeah. And you remember when I talked about that parade I went to in the summer for the Pride Parade, I talked about how the exhaust, breathing the exhaust, because they, they just move very slowly. Yeah. And there's a lot of diesel trucks pulling things. Well, problem solved, Quebec. Way to go. Like they, you know, you got, you got all those children breathing in diesel fumes at other Santa Claus parades across the world or across North America, mostly where they occur. And yeah, electrify that. And it's quiet. Yeah. And you can power music from the various electrical outlets or whatever you want, lights. Yeah. PA so systems. This is this is what I'm getting to. It was seemed to be a mixture of electric vehicles and really? gas or diesel. Really? Yeah. So like there was a Toronto Hydro, like a crane truck, and they had dressed up the crane to look like a candy cane. They'd put a stripe on it. Sure. So it was just this large truck. But then Volkswagen appeared to be a sponsor. So there was about 10 Volkswagen ID Buzz vans. And about every, you know, 100 meters in the parade, there was one of these vans just to... I'm not sure what the point of them was. They they weren't carrying anything okay. specific. Well, that's nice. But yeah, and nice to see that many of them. So they've only recently started selling the ID Buzz electric van. So there's you know. Have you at seen least a cyber truck yet in person? By the way, uh, there was one in Toronto. Yeah, that that drove down the street. And your thoughts? Uh, it's fine. It was wrapped black. Oh, that's yeah. nice. I like I like that. If I was going to like one, I would like the black. That's a really good. Yeah. Look. But then there were other things, like there was one band that wasn't a marching band, like they were all on a trailer. So they were a stationary band, they were playing drums, but that appeared to be being towed by a diesel truck. So yeah, I thought to myself, oh, those poor, sad people playing the music, they're, you know, they're having to breathe in the diesel fumes. Oh, here's an interesting story. You know, my son goes to school city that is two and a half hours away from here. He lives with his great uncle who's now in his 80s, and he is, he lost his wife a few years ago. And she had a condition, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a condition where she was very sensitive to odors. Yeah, very, very sensitive and could not be around odors. And in the last years of her life, maybe the last even decade or two, she couldn't stand odors. So he had to get an electric snowblower. Um, yeah. And he parked his gas one and had to buy one like I did that plugged in just for that reason. So yeah, and I, you know, I live in suburbia here, kind of like an old suburbia, but suburbia nonetheless. And all the old guys are out with their snow blowers for hours, having a gay old time. They they love it when snow comes and they can be manly and, and take care of the family. And they just take their sweet ass time. Me, I just go with my snow blower with its torque and I just you, 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 see ya. You know, I they're just out just literally for hours because I've got a doorbell camera and I check in on them and you can hear them. You can hear <laughs> them through my house. So and probably smell them. So I was mentioning before we started recording that our friend Dean gave me a phone call, which is unusual to have a phone call from someone. But he was asking me about something. We had a long conversation. He said, hey, I listened to your podcast. And he said, one thing that I like about it, not only is, he, is it the clean entry that I like, it's the clean audio. And he ah. works in the film industry as an editor, <laughs> editing feature films now for Department 9 in Edmonton. And he's, yeah, likes our sound quality. So thank you, Dean. I thought I, I told him I would mention that on the show. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's some tariffs coming from Trump in the social media post against Canada. 25% tariffs because we let a couple people through the border and we're going to be punished. And a lot of people say this is just a tactic, a bullying tactic, the way he does business. And it's going to crash the stock market a bit, and they're going to do it while Biden's in office. Well, I, I think we should respond harshly to stuff like that. I think we should do something crazy, like float the idea of taking our tariffs off of Chinese-made EVs and watch the auto industry in the Midwest, United States, freak out, and they start getting pressure from them. You got to deal with a bully as a bully. There's just no yeah. other way to do it. It's the only thing, way they respect him. Well, yeah, trade wars are going to be the 
the the buzzword for the next few years. I it's think, going to affect not. us, but I have a feeling when the dust settles, it's going to be a net positive. That's what a lot of people are talking about, and then we'll talk about that in future shows. That it'll work itself out. For instance, China is just going to be be a bigger trade partner now than other people will be. So we'll, you know, the clean energy emanates from China. By the way, Northvolt, that's a company that the government of Canada gave billions of dollars, that and its provincial counterpart government, to build a battery factory for, I think, EVs, mostly EVs in Canada somewhere in, in Ontario. We talked about it before. They're, they're basically the biggest hope of batteries outside of China, and they are declaring bankruptcy. So one of the people I follow regularly is Michael Dunn. He has a consulting company. He's an expert on the Chinese auto industry, and he says this in the Financial Times, Chinese companies process 70 to 90 percent of their critical minerals like graphite, cobalt, nickel, lithium, and all that stuff needed for battery cells. So even if you invest in world-class battery plant in Europe or Korea or the U.S., chances are you must still ship your critical minerals to China for processing. That adds time, cost, and as we learned during COVID, supply chain risks. So there's a lot of reason why it's being tough to compete with China on batteries. Yeah, and it sounds like this Northvolt plant in Canada is still going ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't heard anything yet. But if it is, great. But maybe somebody else steps in. Maybe it's a Chinese company. I don't know. We talked about this. I speculated that in the robotaxi event that Tesla had, that the people who are actually doing tests have a remote control person to overtake the car. I said, yeah, that's going to be hard to get regulatory approval because Tesla doesn't have such a thing. And a lot of people came back to me and said, well, it won't be that hard. Well, it turns out they're actually doing that. Tesla's prepping a remote control team for the robotaxi, taking a page out of Waymo's book. Waymo is the self-driving robotaxi that you can actually pay for and not have a driver in the car in several U.S. cities, including Los Angeles and San Francisco and Phoenix and more coming to the east, I believe, right now as we speak. Tesla has confirmed through a new job listing that it plans to establish a teleoperation team to remote control its upcoming robotaxi fleet. So that means that they're at least being more realistic about a rollout and what it would look like. So it probably needs this in order, order to deliver a robotaxi service and something that Waymo has already developed. And, you know, when Waymos get stuck, and they do, <laughs> yeah, they get confused in a, some, you know, dead end intersection or something, somebody has to take control. And they have been taking control a lot. You can also push a button in the car and says, pull over, because I don't like what's going on or something. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And that's in the yeah. safety video that they run at the beginning. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I've, I always find those stories kind of fun where the cars, yeah, there was one story where they're all ending up in the same dead end spot. Yeah. and uh, Kind of like a nightclub district at the end of <laughs> the closing time type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I have. Okay, so Australia, there is a big heat wave happening in Australia right about now. So hello to our well, listeners in Well, thanks for Australia. taking all of our heat in Australia. That's why it's so damn cold outside. Do you know what it's like driving in an EV that doesn't have a working heater? It's, I couldn't see through the frost the other day. That's I stuck right. stuck my head out the window with ski goggles on. Go ahead, James take has, our heat. James, James has no heater in his old, old Nissan Leaf. Okay, so this is in the eastern part of Australia, New South Wales and Queensland. This is the first major heat wave of the season, so they're looking for temperatures around 40 Celsius probably today. And yeah, this is a problem because some of their coal plants happen to be offline for regular maintenance. And fossil fuel proponents will always say we need things like coal and natural gas because it's reliable baseload power. But so no, it would guess be what? late spring down there, right? So they're probably <laughs> thinking what? we could take the coal plants offline because we don't need it for heating. We don't need it for cooling yeah. so much. Now's the time to do it. And then the heat wave came early, I'm guessing. Yeah, that sounds like a very good guess. Uh, someone in Australia can fill us in. But I, yeah, I think you're probably right that this heat wave is hitting 
quicker. And some of them were down for scheduled maintenance, and it says some were down for unscheduled maintenance. So this has led to various different alerts in the country, urging people to maybe use less power. They've got, yeah, six gigawatts of coal-fired power plants that are currently unavailable. So yes, conservation measures in place. Maybe your air conditioner doesn't need to be all the way down at 19 Celsius. And there is a fire risk as well. Of course, we know Australia has had a very bad time with uh, wildfires. The risk is medium to high. There's still some moisture in the plants, so it's not the worst possible situation. But, you know, it's always... Let, let me think dangerous. here. We're a month away from our winter solstice. So a month before June turn, this would be late May for them. And they're already having heat waves uh, that are shutting yeah. things down. I mean, that can happen because it's kind of like our summer too, but generally it hasn't happened. And yeah, that's too bad. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's about it. Okay. All right, the COP29 climate conference has come to an end. World leaders have agreed an 11th hour deal on climate finance at the COP29 summit in Azerbaijan. Wealthier countries have pledged $300 billion a year by 2035 to help poorer nations tackle climate change. But there wasn't universal support for the deal, with the Indian delegation calling the figure a paltry sum. COP29, the United Nations uh, climate conference held in Baku, Azerbaijan, has concluded with many disappointed in its final agreement. COP, which stands for Conference of the Parties, is the world's annual climate summit. And each year, it's the stage for major decisions on global climate action this year. COP29 tackled critical topics like climate finance, fossil fuels, and carbon markets, but progress was mixed. And there's plenty of tension about what comes next. And let's start with the biggest financial commitments. That is the biggest thing that they were looking for, is to help the global south deal with climate change, which is not their fault. Most of it is not caused by them. They are developing countries, developing nations. At COP29, one of the top agenda items was climate finance. Essentially, the money wealthy nations pledged to help developing countries tackle the effects of climate change. Not to go off fossil fuels, but to tackle the effects, the, the storms, the erosion, and all these things that happen. And after lengthy negotiations, developed nations agreed to provide at least $300 billion per year by 2035. The fund will be used to help vulnerable nations adapt to the impacts of climate change, whether that's dealing with more severe storms, rising sea levels, or transitioning to cleaner energy sources. Things like air conditioning, refining, cooling is one of the biggest energy drivers, bigger than data centers, which gets a lot of headlines, and bigger than, you know, electrifying transportation. The warming world and the fact that more people can have access to air conditioning is causing the biggest use of energy now and into the immediate future. Here's the thing, though. The final commitment left developing nations disappointment, disappointed. Uh, they were hoping for a much larger sum, $1.3 trillion per year, and they wanted it guaranteed, not just as a value target. And while the COP29 tax did leave room for to aspire to that higher number, the only firm commitment remains at only $300 billion. Why the difference? Well, developing countries argue that private investment and other sources can help meet that trillion-dollar target, while developing countries say that this funding should be a public commitment, something that is guaranteed. So for now, $300 billion is a figure that is on the table. But with such a large gap between needs and commitments, developing countries are already voicing concerns that this outcome doesn't go nearly far enough. One of the most contentious topics at COP29 is last year's language to transition away from fossil fuels. This was a follow-up to the global stock take, quote-unquote, last year, where countries committed to evaluating progress on climate goals, including the reduction of fossil fuels. But this year, oh, the petrol states got a little bit oily and greasy with their greed. They couldn't reach an agreement on how to move forward, largely thanks to Saudi Arabia and other petrol states. Not Canada, I'm proud to say, which is a petrol state, but a lot of these countries are getting really greedy now. 
they had uh, record profits last year and they want more. Essentially, countries are split. Some, particularly those heavily reliant on oil and gas, want to take a slower, less specific approach. Climate be damned. Azerbaijan, the host country, falls into this camp since it relies on fossil fuels for two thirds of its government revenue. Of course, they're a holes and shouldn't be hosting a climate conference, but Putin, believe it or not, was partially to blame for this and these archaic rules that they have to make everyone share the COP conferences. So Azerbaijan pushed back on clear language about a fossil fuel phase-out, which delayed any concrete decisions until COP30 next year, which is going to be held in Brazil. So while there's consensus on the need to reduce fossil fuels to curb climate change, the peace the pace and the specifics of this transition remain deeply divided. Uh, next year's COP in Brazil is now expected to take on this issue with hopefully some clear outcomes. One area where COP29 did see progress was Article 6. Now, if you're not familiar with Article 6, it's the part of the Paris Agreement that deals with international carbon markets, basically systems where countries can buy and sell credits for carbon emissions. These carbon markets are complex, but in theory, they could help reduce emissions faster by allowing countries or companies to offset their emissions. After years of negotiation, COP29 finally agreed on the details of Article 6. This means that the rules now set for countries to participate in global carbon trading, and some of these are seen as positive steps, but critics say there's still a risk that these markets could let countries delay, delay, delay. Yeah, always difficult to get hundreds of countries on the same page, but at least somebody is trying. All right, it's time to dip into the mailbag. All right, this letter is from Sean. And Sean says, I was thinking about James' story about being towed to a dealership. James's epic story last week about his car trouble. He should have had the driver tow him to the dealer, drop the car to fulfill the contract, immediately pick up the car again, tow him to the tire shop. No two-day wait for service, says Sean. What do you say, James? Well, I say that that was my plan, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but I d also, I am money starved, did not want to pay for another tow truck because it's not cheap once you book it. Even if you go 10 minutes away, it's still going to be a large, you know, 100 bucks or something to just uh, engage the guy after because he has got to load it up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, put it on dollies, and that took five, ten minutes. So yeah, and yeah, and he wouldn't have been happy. He would have been happy actually, because he said he had a slow summer. So yeah, yeah, a little extra. But work he's for still him. complaining about all the accidents he had to do on a Saturday. But yeah. yeah, and you did manage to get it done that day, right? I I did get it done. Yes, because yeah. people were there, took pity on me, even though it was appointment only. And I went and grabbed the tire with a friend and brought it back, and that was probably the best way to do it. But yeah, I actually thought of that same idea, Sean. So thanks for writing us. Contact us anytime because we love, 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 love to hear from our listeners or viewers. Yes, we have viewers on various platforms as well, but we prefer the audio podcast because, Brian, it is more refined. Yeah. And you know what? We're on Spotify as a temporary audio uh, video podcast. So that's an addition to our audio, but nobody's watched our video yet. So I don't know if Spotify is suppressing it because it's a duplicate of our channel, essentially. But yeah, it's it's there because Spotify wants to get into video podcasting. But if we do a video podcast, then it completely replaces the audio podcast. Yeah. And a lot of people listen to us on Spotify, so we don't want that. We want the well-edited, completely painstakingly done audio podcast to be there not replaced by a video podcast, which only a handful of people want. So it's kind of a dumb way of doing things. So I started a different channel just to see if there's any takers. So that'll be there as an experiment if you want to check us out. But it's the same basically as our YouTube thing as well. And, you know, Spotify takes the audio and processes it in a bad way. Yeah. And turns it into an audio podcast. And yeah. it's just, it's not. But, yeah. Oh, I much great. prefer the audio version. So yeah, for anybody watching us on video, the audio version is it's tighter, cleaner, it's better. We didn't even do video at the beginning, did we? No, no. It was your idea though. <laughs> what? No, it, it was wasn't. Your idea. No. Yeah, you said everybody's on. You know, just put it on. <laughs> Let's get a channel going. It'll be fine. 
No, I think uh, it was your idea for things like TikTok. Well, TikTok was, was yeah, that was yeah. a thing. That's been an, a lot of people have come to us from TikTok because we've got tens of thousands of followers there, but sometimes videos go viral into the millions occasionally, but not lately for some reason. Yeah. That's because I haven't been po posting as many and, 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 you know, they like sp certain kinds of videos. Like they'll like our nuclear story this week. They'll like our waves story from last week. They like technology that your average person hasn't thought of. Yeah. They love stuff like that. But yeah, we do love to hear from our listeners. So contact us by email cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. You can join the conversation on our Patreon page and get access to additional free content because we like to post there. It is our social media platform of choice. And remember to follow us on Blue Sky because that's where all the cool kids are now, Brian. It's where the energy Twitter now resides is on Blue Sky and everyone's there and we have more followers in like two weeks than we have in years of Twitter. We weren't prolific tweeters, okay? Yeah. We You need to tweet a lot to get followers, but we do post, you know, delays in the podcast or, you know, any uh, important information is there. You'll be able to find that on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash clean energy show, I believe, or just search us. Yeah, and our clean energy pod dot bsky dot social blue sky social clean energy pod is our handle there as well we're over there join us we'll start putting stuff there more often i think i will post the links to our show although elon musk says he doesn't like external links and he's been deprioritizing them in the algorithm so it'll be, the link will have to be in the replies now i'll have to say we've got a great show this week and then the reply will say here's the link because He's a jackass. There, I said it. Yeah, so I am on Blue Sky as well, although I, every once in a while I just get social media PTSD, and, and some days I feel like, even though, yes, Blue Sky is, is better and I'm following a bunch of good climate people, I still get you know PTSD sometimes of maybe I should just stay away from social oh, media. Of course altogether. you should. Of course, yeah. everyone should stay away. <laughs> just listen to our podcast, and yeah. that's it. The audio or version, if have, please. If, if you must, watch us, but... We do prefer the audio version. I'm sorry, yes. but it, it's up to you. I mean, we do have lovely lighting and video on the, the video. Sure. Sure. Uh, okay. Next story is from Canary Media, and I wanted to talk about this for two reasons. Number one, it's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I just happened to visit just shortly before the U.S. election. And this is a really cool idea. When I was in Ann Arbor, it did seem like a very democratic-leaning place. I I saw a lot of you know, Harris signs around downtown. Michigan, how did Michigan end up voting? Trump, slightly. Yeah, that's what I thought. But yeah, you're not on the news. He's not on the news, people. Give him, cut him some yeah. slack. <laughs> I'm in Canada. I don't care. And so, you're broadcasting from a palm shelter. So who knows what's going on in the above world? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the story from Canary Media voters in Ann Arbor, Michigan, create a local clean energy utility. So. It sounds like they've had some difficulties in the last few years with their for-profit utility that serves the area. And they've had a lot of outages, especially with the more severe weather that's coming. So in the city of 120,000, they voted 79% in favor of a measure to create a sustainable energy utility that will supplement the existing grid and help the residents shift to cleaner, more reliable energy. So this is the small... I guess, you know, core of Ann Arbor. And, you know, this is definitely uh, probably more left leaning in the, in the downtown there, but yeah, 79%. That's really great. We should do that here. You know yeah. what? If our utility doesn't get his crap together, the urban people who vote differently than the rural should get together and start our own utility. You should be the man to do it, Brian. You should start it. I'll start get the process. I'll get right on that. <laughs> CEO of your own utility. Think about that. Oh, By yeah. the way, they sell, Hard hats at the dollar store now, I noticed. <laughs> we should each get one for our show and put our logo on it. I yep. don't know why. They can't be that safe. That's all I'm saying. No, yeah. Okay, so with the overwhelming approval, city officials will now have to figure out the governance, staffing, and leadership of the new local utility. They've begun outreach already. 600 customers had registered by Tuesday afternoon. The plan is to assemble an initial tranche of about 20 megawatts worth of power, which 
At that point, Ann Arbor will finance and purchase the installation of solar panels, batteries, and energy efficiency upgrades to serve those customers. So the installations will be on homes, sheds, schools, libraries. They could happen in the next 18 sheds, to 24 you say. months. Sheds? 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 Yes. <laughs> that's odd. That's, I mean, that's, that speaks they, out to me. Maybe they got a lot of sheds in Michigan. I don't know. <laughs> Do you? Um, Do you, Michigan? Longer term, the utility hopes to construct a district-level geothermal network to heat and cool buildings without fossil fuels. So this is going to be great for their carbon future and for the pocketbook, which we always love to point out. It's not just saving the planet is the reason to do this, but you can save money as well. These clean energy solutions are likely going to be better and cheaper than the ones provided by their for-profit utility, which sounds like they've been slacking on uh, maintenance and upgrades. Well, that's terrific. I like that. And I want to hear more. So let's let's keep an eye on that or see if anyone else does that. Do you have any follow up to that? Yeah, no, I, I, it says here that there's been a sporadic national trend of communities trying to break free from the century old model of for profit monopoly utilities controlling local energy systems. So here in Canada, we mostly have government monopolies, government owned utilities. But in the U.S., it, it sounds like they're mostly for profit. And, you know, they're going to care t more about profit than, you know, fixing. Stuff. So basically the power lines stay the same, but you, they are allowed to feed into it and you are allowed to buy from it. It's kind of like, you know, an internet system to your house that the telephone company or cable company has a smaller outfit can come along and say, you know, we want to do that. Or in our case, like, you know, small cellular companies still use the main networks of the big corporations because there's only a couple here in Canada. I don't know how many there are in the United States. Yeah. But because we're so vast and sparse, we only have two. So a smaller thing like Virgin Mobile, for instance, will just pay them to be on your system, but they'll have their own pricing. So I like that. Yeah. And the plan is to sell this power at cost. They don't particularly want to make money on it. They're not doing it for money. It's it's a public service which there's is no really... ceo walking away well there's your okay you're not yeah. gonna get rich <laughs> <laughs> but yeah this but... you know we all need power so it really should be more of a public service than a for-profit venture anyway oh spoken like a canadian you know, communist yeah i'm <laughs> kidding of course yeah so james is the communist on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> sure sure i am driving around in my unheated electric car Ah, it's time for some nuclear news. It's another milestone for the next generation nuclear plant in Oak Ridge. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has now approved construction permits for Kairos, Kairos Power's second Hermes demonstration plant, which is made up of two test reactors, by the way. This is coming to the Heritage Center Industrial Park. The first Hermes reactor is already under construction at the former site of the K-25 gaseous diffusion process building. Cairo says it will apply what it has learned from the first Hermes reactor to Hermes 2. That first reactor, by the way, became the first generation four reactor in the U.S. to receive a nuclear regulatory commission construction permit. What did he say? Gaseous diffusion process center? That sounds I, like uh, my underwear. I don't know. Like uh, that, that, that struck me. So anyway, Brian, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC, has just approved the construction of the nation's first electricity producing Gen 4 nuclear reactor designed by Keros Power. This reactor called Hermes 2 represents a major leap forward in advanced nuclear technology, they claim, and Keros Power Hermes 2 will be located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Shout out to Tennessee. This reactor isn't your traditional setup. Hermes 2 is a 70 megawatt thermal facility that will generate 20 megawatts of electricity using two small reactors. Now, I've criticized solar farms in our jurisdiction for being only 10 megawatts versus tiny. Yeah. A nuclear reactor is basically 1,000 in the, in the neighborhood of 1,000. It could be 800, it could be 1,200. It's in the neighborhood of 1,000 megawatts or a, yeah, a gigawatt. So this is really small, and I have to wonder why. I mean, I can, I can see great uses for this. You think of a community in the Arctic Circle that needs power and the sun doesn't shine for half the year hardly. That would be great, or for maybe a remote mining operation. But yeah, unlike conventional reactors, Hermes 2 Hermes uses 
a unique molten salt cooling system rather than water. That makes it safer and more efficient at cooling. This high temperature system improves heat transfer and maintains near atmospheric pressure, so you don't have a lot of pressure in the system, hmm. which reduces risks associated with pressure buildup, which they claim makes it a, you know, safer than traditional nu nuclear. Construction of Hermes 2 follows Cairo's non-electric demonstration reactor, the Hermes 1, which didn't generate electricity, just demonstrated, you know, cooling and efficiency. And this is expected to be completed by 2027 if everything stays on track. Hermes 2 could start producing electricity for the grid by the end of 27. What's the big deal, you ask, Brian? Well, first, Hermes 2 is the first Gen 4 reactor licensed for construction in the United States. Gen 4 refers to advanced nuclear technologies that emphasize safety, efficiency, and sustainability. Hermes 2's cooling system using fluoride salt ensures the reactor can handle high temperatures without relying on water, which is especially important in areas where water resources are scarce, getting more scarce thanks to climate change. Secondly, Kairos power design uses an innovative fuel type called TRISO, triso fuel. This is a pebble-like fuel coated in layers that prevent the release of radioactive materials, even in high temperatures. This combination of molten salt cooling and triso fuel makes Hermes 2 a safer, more resilient option in the event of an emergency. We will argue that this probably won't get as cheap as other renewable energy like wind, solar, and batteries, but they are progressing. Beyond its technical achievements, Hermes 2 approval also signals progress in the NRC's regulatory approach. Yes, the government is getting more able, more likely to license stuff like this. Yeah, approvals for everything in this new energy future need to go quicker. The accelerated process reflects the NRC's commitment to streamlining its reviews, which could encourage other companies to develop innovative reactors in the United States. However, Brian, there's no time. We have to decarbonize the grid by 2035. That's 10 years. That's not enough time to be fooling around too much with nuclear. So what does this mean for the future of energy in the United States? Well, if successful, Hermes 2 could pave the way for larger commercial nuclear plants based on this advanced technology. And sure, if you're going to build nuclear, build them safer, build them with more sustainably with, you know, this technology, and hopefully it works out fine. It seems to be. It may be a step towards a clean, carbon-free energy that's safer and more adaptable than before, but, you know, all remains to be seen. All right, from Electrek, Caltrain makes history with the fully electric trains on the San Francisco to San Jose route. So this is a 160-year-old uh, rail corridor, Caltrain, and they have converted all the trains from diesel to zero emission electric. This is the first diesel to electric transition in North America in a generation, says this article from Electrek. And uh, other benefits, this electric service is faster and more frequent. So if you're going to upgrade your trains, your diesel trains, you might as well go electric because they're better for many different reasons, not just the environment. So during the peak hours, the trains are going to run every 15 to 20 minutes at 16 stations. Express service from San Francisco to San Jose will take less than an hour. And weekend service will be twice as frequent before. They're going to have seven cars instead of the previous five to six. And the new electric trains accelerate and decelerate faster than the diesel fleet, allowing for more frequent stops in the same amount of time. That's the headline feature for me. We know that electric vehicles tend to be faster to, you know, speed up and slow down. And that makes a big difference if you're on a train route with 16 different stops. It can take forever. But what if you're standing, Brian? What if it's a standing room only subway car and you fall to the floor? No, I like the idea. I do because... You know, the SkyTrain in Vancouver is automated, right? It's not, it's, there's no staff yeah, there's, on it. There's no drivers, yeah. No drivers. There may be security staff. But whenever public transit fails, it's often because of the frequency. So I'm encouraged by technology where this electrified transportation of the future is maybe self driven and we are allowed to maybe make smaller trains, smaller buses more frequent, and then more people will use it. That's my my hopeful thinking. Yeah, and presumably the cost per mile is going to be cheaper, just like it is with an electric vehicle compared to a diesel vehicle. So if it's cheaper to run, then yeah, you can run more routes, which is great. All right, coming up is the lightning round, unless you're watching on TikTok or 
Instagram, you'll have to listen to the audio podcast or check us out on YouTube. Right back. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. When future residents turn up the heat in six new apartment buildings planned for downtown San Jose, California, it will come from nearby data centers. That's right, these giant buildings with computers processing your social media rage all produce a lot of heat. Your computers produce a lot of heat, especially if they're working you know, on AI, which is using graphic processors at high speed. And the proposed project is the first in the US to send excess heat from data centers to the local community at a large scale, making use of the abundant heat generated as servers process and use data for San Jose as part of a bigger plan to reduce the emissions in the city. We have a link on fastcompany.com there for you. I, I love the idea, Brian. We think about, you know, you had the idea because we live in a cold climate to have a refrigerator that's just open to the outdoors. It was cooled yeah. by the outdoors. Well, maybe we should <laughs> use that excess heat to put it to good use. And well, yeah. how much heating does San Jose really need? Yeah, that's true. It's kind of a warm place. But yeah, if you have an office building that's really well insulated, Quite often, just the heat from everybody's computers is enough to uh, to keep the place warm. So, yeah, reusing that heat. Computers throw off a lot of heat. It's kind of crazy. If you're listening pretty much anywhere in California, you don't know what cold is. If you went outside my front door right now for one second, you would scream in horror <laughs> because that's how bad it is. It's terrible. Anyway, uh, Trump's return may shift the U.S. EV market down a gear. Electric vehicles are now expected to only reach 33% of new passenger car sales in at the end of the decade compared to 48%. I'm not so sure. We'll see. Because, you know, I think that whenever there's a slow lag in EVs, it catches up eventually once, the you know, the prices and the availability yeah. and it all just sort of, it's not necessarily quite a straight line, but if there is a, a, a pushback, it, it picks up again later. Yeah, and Hyundai had a statement this week. They're not going to slow down their EV, you know, production no matter what. So we'll see what happens. Maine is set to speed up their 100% renewable electricity goal from 2050 down to 2040 with an 80% goal by 2030. There's 19 states, Brian, plus Puerto Rico and D.C. that have set up 100% renewable energy goals. Good for you. Oh, it's time for a CES. That's fat. Plastic? causes three times the greenhouse gas emissions of aviation. That's from Carbon Brief. Oh, there's another one. 25% of new vehicles sold in LA, that is Los Angeles, if you are not familiar with the term LA, are zero emission, 25%, okay? But the rate is 30% in San Francisco Bay Area. Interesting. In which we have listeners, I know. But it's 35% Quebec. We mentioned that last week in the province of Quebec, Canada. Way to go. Yep. Numbers are creeping up. It's great. Ahead of the overdue rollout of its V4 supercharger hardware, Tesla is installing longer cables. I'm glad to see that as a non-Tesla owner who may want to use their network and making other changes that may help avoid friction. You see, if you take a non-Tesla EV to a, which you can now do to a Tesla, you have to take out two parking spots. Yeah. Because the cables are short and they're designed for where the charge port is on the Tesla. But longer cables solve that problem. Yeah, and it depends on what your car is, but the yeah, the stations are designed for the port to be in the driver's back corner. And yeah, if your other EV doesn't have it in the same spot, it's a bit of a pain. This is from Electric California EV maker Rivian has said it has secured conditional approval of a loan of up to six point six billion from the US Department of Energy to build a production facility in Georgia. This is they were going ahead with the factory, then they weren't, and we didn't know why. Well, among those conditions of getting that money is a big one. It's the, the company has to not actively oppose union organizing efforts. So Georgia, pro-union. The new plant would be able to build 400,000 vehicles a year when complete. Some things don't make sense to me, Brian. Yeah. You know, they put down the right-wing red states put down unions and then they insist on them i don't get it byd is apparently launching a new generation of its lfp blade ev batteries 
This is the battery that enables a that exists now and it enables ten thousand dollar EVs in China that have over four hundred kilometers of range. The same battery, but they got a new generation of them coming out already. They say the new generation of battery coming to vehicles in 2025 will give you even more range and it will last longer and it will be safer. BYD is the Chinese car company, as you know, and it's the second largest battery maker in the world as well, behind CATL, which is also the Chinese company. A new S&P Global Data Canadian ZEV sales, that is zero emission electric vehicles, which includes plug-in hybrids and possibly hydrogen vehicles, all six of them. The sales in the third quarter of 2024 reached 16.5%, or one of six approximately vehicles, an all-time high and is a 14.4% increase over all Q2, not last year, but Q2. So S&P predicts that EVs will make up 15.2% of all light duty vehicle sales when this year is done. Not bad. Yeah. No, that's not bad. And in places like Quebec and BC, that number is going to be a lot higher. But then there's laggard provinces like where we live, where the number's lower. But, you know, 16.5% as a national average of, of EV sales, one in six, that's pretty good. And finally this week, California Governor Gavin Newsom on Monday unveiled plans to offer state incentives to EV buyers if President-elect Donald J. Trump repeals a federal subsidy after he takes office next year, and God knows he probably will. A Newsom, a prominent Democrat who has fashioned himself a climate leader, said in a statement that a program California phased out in 2023 could be rebooted to provide car buyers relief in lieu of a $7,500 tax credit that is currently available under the Biden administration. So you buy a car, they take $7,500 off. You lease a car for like two or three years, it gets really cheap because they take the full amount off. It's kind of a loophole. And by the way, <laughs> if you're looking to get an EV in the States and you haven't, you have a number of weeks probably, maybe months, before you may not get such a great deal. So think about leasing a vehicle and get it very, very cheap, cheaper than a gas vehicle. And then there's the operational maintenance cost. Anyway, here's the thing, Brian. Tesla electric vehicles would be excluded from consumer rebates proposed by California's governor. This is harsh, harsh. That's a little confusing. I'm not sure how they can make that work, but we'll see if that actually... Uh, he, says, he says it's to spur competition because Tesla is a, a big market leader. Yeah. But I think it's because Musk said, screw you, California, we're leaving. <laughs> so... That's it for the lightning round. But that's interesting. Of course, California has a population very similar to the entire country of Canada. So, you know, it is a massive population that has at least as much important in the world as uh, Canada does. So, you know, they're not going to slow down, just like many countries are not or many states are not. Right. All right. Well, that's our show for this week. Please take the time to contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Around social media, we're Clean Energy Pod. And please join our Patreon. That's our new favorite place for everybody to join and gather. And you can support the show with a purchase from the merch store that's listed in the show notes or on the website. And uh, please rate and review us if you can on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, remember to click and follow us on your favorite podcast app. And of course, the audio version is our favorite version. We'll say that again, but we do offer other options on uh, YouTube and various places. Thank you to all of our Patreon members, Apple Podcast subscribers and YouTube membership holders for supporting our show. We really, really appreciate it. Join our Patreon today as a paying member and get access to our exclusive bonus episodes. We have one coming up, Brian, in a week or two. We'll be doing another one. And you can also get ad-free episodes and Discord server access, discounts at our merch store, early access to episodes, all kinds of things like thank you credits and shout outs on the podcast, which we'll be doing next week. So see you again in seven days. See you next week. The Clean Energy Show.